Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of EE102. So we're going to start with some quick announcements. Um, the homework is due this Friday at 11.59 p.m. And always in this class, you will have the tools covered by the Wednesday lecture to do the Friday lecture. Okay, and mostly you'll have the tools uh, cumulatively. All right, so you'll never be in a rush where the lectures will be ahead or behind of the homework. So it'll be right on time. So my suggestion is, you know, do all the questions that you can from the previous lectures. If anything is left, you know, do it on the Wednesday lecture. So in today's lecture, we're going to cover a little bit about the periodicity. We're going to take a brief detour on the next slide because there was a homework question about this. At the very end, we're going to cover systems, but we're going to be a little bit delayed with systems, so we will only do an introduction to systems at the very base level. Okay. All right. So here's the sidebar that I was discussing. Um, the sum or product of periodic signals is itself periodic if a condition holds. Okay. If so let's say that you have um, a signal x1 with period t1 and a signal x2 with period t2. Now this signal, you know, the sum or product, either x1 plus x2 or x1, x2 is periodic if there exists some sort of common period, if there is a common T. Such that T equals some constant K1, T1, which equals K2, T2, okay. where K1 and K2 are some integers. Now, if this holds, then if I just rearrange the equality above, what that means is I can write T1 over T2 as being equal to, let's see, T1 over T2 is going to equal K2 over K1. So if I were to take my two signals, x1 and x2, and I were to divide their periods as such, I can express this as a rational number with some integer constants, k2 and k1. Right? That's basically what this is saying. So let's just go one layer deeper so we can come up with the understanding another way. I'm going to erase this bubble here, and I'm going to erase this. And we're going to use a new color. And let's come up with uh, sort of an analogy of what's going on. Let's pretend that you run high school track and you run high school track and it takes you, I don't know, it takes you maybe something like, um, you know, nine minutes to run a mile. And your friend is able to run that same mile, or let's just use, uh, yeah, nine minutes, and your friend is able to run that mile in some other time, let's say a little bit shorter, let's say your friend is able to run that same mile in about seven minutes. Okay. Or let's say your friend is even faster, let's make it six minutes. Okay. Six minutes to run a mile. So by the time your friend has started here and has run the mile, and he's completed his mile, unfortunately, you are still somewhere over here, maybe, okay? So you would be somewhere over here, and your friend would have fully completed the mile. Now, when we talk about a periodic signal, what that means is if you think of this as being, let's say the red one is cosine omega t, omega 1 t, and the purple one is cosine omega 2t, in order for, uh, if your periods synchronize, what that effectively means is that 
the value of the signal is the same, right? Remember that a signal is periodic if you know there exists some constant uh, t1 such that f of t plus t1 equals f of t, you know, for all t. And in order for this to to hold, what that effectively means is that the value of these two are equal. For these values to be equal, in our case, one way to look at it is that the arguments need to be equal, right? Clearly, because the function is the same, if the arguments are the same, then, uh, then they are equal. And so one way to analyze that in the example we're providing here is effectively omega 1 t has to equal omega 2 t up to a constant. So there exists some constant k1, which I can multiply omega 1 t by, and there is some other constant k2, which I can multiply omega 2 t by, such that these two are equal. Okay. So if this, this were to hold, then uh, it would satisfy this equation above of periodicity. Now, in order for this to hold, uh, effectively what's going to happen, the t's are going to cancel, the lowercase t's are going to cancel out here. Right. What effectively happens is that omega 1 divided by omega 2 equals k1 over k2, or I'm, I'm sorry, k2 over k1. Now, looking at this uh, example that we've provided, uh, the ratio of the frequencies omega 1, omega 2 is effectively 9 by 6, right? So uh, we were at 9 minutes to run a mile, and our friend was at 6 minutes. So uh, if that ratio is 9 by 6, okay, so let's just say this is 9 by 6, then 9 by 6 is equal to 1 and a half, and 1 and a half can also be written as 3 over 2. Okay. And so this is one uh, intuition for uh, having a common period. So if I were to add up uh, these signals, uh, if I were to add these two to a new function, f of t, this is going to repeat at essentially 3 halves times the period uh, t1. Okay. So uh, in this particular example, uh, three halves would be the constant. So you can actually uh, look at what it would take uh, for this to repeat, right? So uh, for example, K2 is three. So every 18 minutes, this would repeat. So every 18 minutes, you know, you would end up uh, meeting your friend. So if you plug in these numbers, you should see that you come up with the same answer. And one way to intuitively see this is that you can see that at 18 minutes, the person who runs a nine minute mile is back at the finish line, right? They've run two miles, so they're back exactly where they started. And at 18 minutes, the person who's run a six minute mile has run three miles, and they're also back where they started, okay? And then this cycle continues over and over again, right? And the next 18 minutes, uh, the same, you know, the same thing holds. Okay, so let me erase here. Erase. This mile example is just another way of thinking about the same intuition we had before, which is that T1 divided by T2 equals K2 over K1 for some constants k2 and k1. Now, all this is saying is that if I divide the ratio of the periods, right, which in our case was nine minutes divided by six minutes, right, if I divide that ratio of periods, it gives me some number, like nine over six, which is one and a half, that I can write in terms of a fraction. So we call this, any number that you can write in terms of a fraction is called a rational number. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, 
um, nine by six, right? It could have been anything else. I could have run an eight minute mile. My friend could have run a six minute mile and I can still write this as a rational number, right? It's eight divided by six, which actually simplifies to uh, four thirds, right? So what is a rational number? One way to think, remind yourself what a rational number is, is actually to mispronounce it. So sometimes I pronounce it wrong intentionally as ratio null number. Uh, it's a ratio null number because it's a number that can be explicitly written as a ratio, okay? Um, in contrast, a number that is not rational or ratio null is an irrational number. And so if the ratio of the periods is irrational, then I cannot write it in this form of K2 over K1 by definition. And therefore, uh, the sum or, uh, or product of such signals would not be periodic, okay? So as a check your understanding question, uh, try to come up with an example. An example where the sum or product is a periodic. Okay. So go ahead and pause the video and come up with an example. Just as a hint, your goal is to come up with uh, maybe two cosine waves such that uh, the ratio of their periods is something that is kind of uh, not able to be represented as a rational number. Okay. Very good. Let me just close this sidebar here. Okay. How do I exit the search? Okay, um, so my computer is behaving a little bit frozen right now, but hopefully you've answered the check your understanding question. And so the answer to this question is, okay, so let me figure out how to get a new page. Just bear with me for a moment. Just get a new page so it's not super cluttered. Options. Paper. I'll just Google it. Sorry to keep you waiting. How to get a new page in Notability. this. Nice thumbnail. Copy. Hmm. Okay, great. So now we should have a blank sheet of paper. So let me just go to the previous slide. So let's, let me write the check your understanding question more clearly. Check your understanding. Please come up with an x1, x2 such that the sum product is 
aperiodic. Okay, so that was our goal. So now uh, one way to do that is remember that we need this ratio t1 over t2 to not be a rational number. So what is an example of an irrational number? An irrational number is like pi, right? Pi is irrational. And the reason that pi is irrational is because pi cannot be written as a fraction. Sometimes in school, uh, like high school, they may tell you that pi is approximately 22 over seven. I think this is a really bad way to think about it because pi is not exactly 22 over seven. This is just a fractional approximation. So it confuses a lot of people into thinking that pi is a rational number when it's really actually an irrational number. So high level, because of, this is an approximation, the answer is that pi itself is an irrational number, okay? So if pi is irrational, then all we need to do is this t1 over t2 needs to be some multiple of pi. We can just choose it to be, for example, uh, pi itself, right? It could you just be pi, or it could be 2 pi, or it could be anything like that. So uh, one way to look at whether uh, this is true is to consider a cosine, let's say, let's say one example is going to be uh, cosine of, um, you know, um, omega t. And the other uh, signal is going to be cosine of, let's just pick a number like 2t. Okay. So the, the ratio of these periods, right, if I look at these uh, uh, periods, if I look at these periods, um, excuse me, this should be pi, cosine of pi t plus cosine of 2t, I can see that there's a pi here, and there's no pi here, right? There's a pi here, and there's no pi here. So therefore, I know that as soon as I take this, this ratio, I know I'm going to end up with some multiplication of pi, and therefore, it's going to be irrational equals some constant c times pi. So you can calculate out what that constant is for these two cosines and leave that as an exercise. But basically, this summation would be irrational. So one way as a cheat sheet just to know if something is going to be, you know, uh, uh, so this summation is aperiodic, okay, aperiodic. And one way as a cheat sheet to know if it's going to be aperiodic is just right away you glance at it, you see there's a pi in one term and there's, there's, there's not a pi in the other term. Therefore, you know one, pi will not cancel. And therefore, you know it's going to be aperiodic. Uh, in contrast, if you had uh, pi in both, like for example, cosine of uh, you know 3 pi t plus cosine of 6 pi t, now you know that the pi's will cancel, and this would be actually a periodic summation. OK, very good. Let's move on to the rest of the lecture. So remember, we were talking about sinusoids. And uh, you illustrated a, a real sinusoid as x of t equals a cosine omega t minus t. Okay. Here, uh, capital T naught uh, equals 1 over f, which is the period. And remember that omega equals 2 pi f. So in this particular example, um, if the period t naught equals 1 over f, right, uh, f, let's write, let's write a goal here. Let's write t naught in terms of omega. This could be helpful for the previous slide to answer that check your understanding question. So if I want to write t naught in terms of omega, well, all I have to do is see that um, f equals omega over 2 pi. And since t naught equals 1 over f, t naught equals 2 pi over omega. So in the previous slide, if you want to look at the period here of uh, this signal, for example, t is going to equal 2 pi over pi, which is going to equal 2, right? Here, this is going to be 2 pi over 2. And this is going to equal, the 2's will cancel. So it's going to equal pi. Okay. 
And so you can see that if I look at these ratio of periods, I'm going to still be left with a pi after taking the ratio. OK. Now let's move on to complex sinusoids. I noticed there was a question on the piazza about uh, how this is exactly like the cosine when there's an imaginary part. And this is not exactly the same as a real sinusoid, right? This is not exactly the same as a real sinusoid. Uh, but for the purpose of EE102, we actually use the complex sinusoid in the stead of the real sinusoid because in the later lecture, you'll see that we actually do care about both the real and the imaginary parts. So one way to look at this is to write the complex sinusoid as the summation, just expand out Euler's, and you end up with a cosine omega t plus phi uh, plus j a sine omega t plus uh, some phase term. So sometimes I'll say theta and phi interchangeably if only one of them is on the slide, because people use uh, either phi or theta to represent the phase interchangeably. OK, so uh, when we draw this on a plot, we're going to use dotted lines for the imaginary part. Now, when I said that the complex sinusoid is very closely linked to the real sinusoid, effectively what you can do is you could take the real part of the complex sinusoid and you'll end up with exactly the uh, real sinusoid. But the complex sinusoid is useful because in this compact mathematical expression, like this, is, this mathematical expression is very compact. Inside this compact mathematical expression, we are also able to have this powerful imaginary part, which also gives us a sinusoid that we can draw. So just with this, you know, representation of E of J of omega t, I have encoded not just the cosine, but also a sine. And if I simply want to get one or the other, I can just do a real operator here and get back to the cosine or vice versa, the matrix operator. As we'll see on the following slides, the complex sinusoid actually encodes a lot of behavior. First, let's start with what is an exponential. So if we think about the exponential function, in this particular example, I have uh, an exponential with two different constants of sigma. So I have e to the sigma t. If sigma is positive, right, if that's greater than zero, then the signal is going to grow. That's going to be exponential growth. Uh, in contrast, in blue, what I've shown on the plot in blue is a negative sigma. So if sigma is negative, then you have exponential decay. Now, where this becomes interesting is in the context of damping or growing our sinusoids, right? Remember, everything revolves around a sinusoid. And we may want to, over time, reduce the amplitude of a sinusoid or, or increase the amplitude of a sinusoid over time. This would be an example for, uh, in the music example that we gave in the beginning of class, what we did was we essentially had a tone with some frequency. And then we increased the volume of that. Uh, and that's what this does. It, it grows it. Conversely, if a musician is playing a song, uh, maybe it's just you know a singer holding a high note. That's too loud for me. I turn down the radio. Uh, that's like damping the kind of sinusoid. So these are practical examples of growing or damping sinusoids. This is an example of, in this case, exponential growth of a sinusoid, where the amplitude of the sinusoid grows exponentially. This curve that is dashed in blue font right here on the slide is actually giving us uh, a tracing an outline of where the peaks are. And you can see that outline being traced corresponds to the exponential growth. So the complex sinusoid is denoted as x of t equals e to the sigma plus j omega t. And you can see this is very, very closely linked to the previous representation here. Right? It's super closely linked. The difference is that we express this in terms of the complex sinusoid. So if I think about my complex sinusoid, I'm going to ignore the phase term for the moment. So complex sinusoids is e to the j omega t. Okay, And then remember that the exponential damping or growth is going to be e to the sigma t. So if I'm multiplied by some function, right, f of t. And so if f of t was the complex exponential, then I end up with e of sigma t times e of j omega t, which is nothing but e of sigma plus j omega t. And so you see how we get to this derivation here. Now, uh, this particular signal is a combination of the complex sinusoid and the exponential. Uh, every previous signal that we've discussed are basically 
expressed in terms of this complex exponential signal. So this signal is also known as a complex exponential. Sometimes you'll see that this signal can have additional terms as well. We could have a, another amplitude here that is not time dependent, right? It could be AE to the, right? Uh, I could also jazz it up with a phase term. I could also have here, so I'm not including theta here, but I could very easily bring back theta if I wanted to from the previous slide. So uh, if you look at the plot here, the plot is a little bit different. It's subtly different. It's the same plot as the previous slide, but now we include that dashed line for the imaginary component. One intuitive trick that you can do, uh, sometimes people divide it in this way, they think of complex exponentials in a new plane called the uh, essentially the decay term as well as the uh, frequency term. So for example, you might have um, two axes here. This axis is sigma. This axis is j omega. And so anything here in this part of the region would be exponential decay. And anything here would be exponential growth. So now we're going to discuss some useful functions uh, that we should know about in context of this class. Uh, the first one is called the heat aside step function. So the heat aside step function, also known as the unit step function, is an elementary function that we use in EE102. The basic idea is that um, you, know, you have this function. We're going to represent it by u of t. And that function is going to equal 1 if time is greater than or equal to 0, or it'll equal 0 if time is less than 0. So if you draw it, it's going to look like this plot here. Okay. Now, this function is called the Hebiside step function, known af no, uh, named after Oliver Hebiside uh, from the United Kingdom. And um, it's a very elementary function. It, uh, you can ask yourself, is this a causal function or an anti-causal function, right? Uh, so check your understanding at home. Is this function causal? But effectively, it models a lot of physical phenomena that we deal with. For example, a transistor switching on, uh, a light bulb switching on, uh, the start of uh, a recording. So it's a very useful function that often comes up. Another useful function is the unit rect function, the rectangle function. So the uh, rectangle function looks like the following. Okay. It's going to equal one if the time is greater than one half or less, uh, greater than negative one half or less than one half, right? So the absolute value of t is less than or equal to one half. Otherwise, it's going to equal zero. So let's take a, take a stab at drawing how this would look. On one axis, I have here time t. And on the other axis, I have amplitude. And so here is going to be time t equals 0. Uh, let's say that this is going to be 0 0.5. This is going to be 1. This is going to be minus 0 0.5. This is going to be minus 1. All right. So a rect function, let's say I wanted to draw a function rect of t, the standard rect function, then I would draw something like this. So it's also labeled the y-axis. Let's say this is 1 on the y-axis. Then the rect function will look something like this in this particular plot. Oops. Let's undo. All right. So this is how the rec function would look like. So this is the canonical rec function. And we actually are also interested in a little bit of a different rec function, which uh, we modify to have kind of a width. So if we look at the canonical rec function, it has a width of one, right? 
But what if we want a rec function where we could specify the width? And so then we have a rec function. We call it rec sub delta. And so rec sub delta of t is nothing but another piecewise function, one over delta. over two and zero elsewhere. So if I think about the uh, canonical rect function as a quick check your understanding, so CYU, what is delta for rect of t? So feel free to pause the video. And if we explicitly specify the width, you can calculate what the delta is for the standard rec function. Okay, welcome back. So those of you who calculated it out, you may have gotten something like the answer here would be delta is nothing but one. So let's draw another example. What happens if we have If we reduce delta to equal one half. So go ahead and give an attempt and try to draw what uh, delta equals one half would be. So you would be trying to draw essentially rect of 0 0.5 of t. Okay, welcome back. Those of you who drew it, you would have gotten negative 0.25 here. 0 0.25, and it's going to go up. This is going to be 2. And so the rec function got taller and skinnier, but the area is still the same. I know that uh, this may seem disconnected from the heat aside step function, but we're going to actually just build up the basics by learning about uh, a few functions, and then we'll learn how, how a lot of signals can be represented in terms of these elementary components. So one more elementary component is the unit ramp function. So if I were to write down the unit ramp function, I might see something like this. The ramp function, we denote as having r of t. Okay, that's r of t for ramp. And that equals another piecewise function of t if t is non-negative, so this is greater than or equal to, and zero if t is negative. And so if you were to draw this on a curve, you might end up with something like this. Here you have time, and you essentially end up having r of t here. This would be one. This would be one and this would be zero. All right, so this is the unit ramp function. So now if I look at the ramp function as a checker understanding, how can I express R of T in terms of the earlier building blocks, right? How do I express R of T in terms of the earlier building blocks? So effectively, what I'd like you to do is we've learned about a couple of previous functions. These include the um, rectangle function, as well as the step function, and see if you can express, see if you can express the ramp function in terms of either of these. Okay, feel free to pause the video and rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write out this um, RAM function, R of T. So on the left-hand side, we have R of T. And we're going to write it in a different way. We're going to write it as the integral of minus infinity to t of u of tau d tau. Okay, so let's dissect what this is. 
Remember that the function u is the Hebicide step function. And so you can kind of see just visually, if I start integrating the step function, I'm going to end up with a ramp function, right? Because the step function when it's non-negative is basically just one. And the integral of a function that's just one is effectively going to be exactly t, right? So it makes perfect sense that we would just simply integrate the step function. But one, of the, one subtlety here that's kind of important to consider is if you notice when we did this integration, we used a different domain here. And this is very common in signal processing where your integral domain is different from your output domain. And we do that to avoid variable confusion. Okay. And so if I actually compute this integral, um, what you'll end up getting is R of T is going to equal T times U of T. So this um, integral sort of, we call this integral substitution. If you look at this integral here, the integral is over a dummy variable tau. So tau is a dummy variable. But the actual variable, the sort of uh, variable that I care about, the time variable, is back, but it's in the limit of the integral. But the limit of the integral contains the variable I care about. Variable time. So if I actually integrate this, we can see in a picture what this might look like. So I have here a curve. I have a plot here. And in this particular case, the integral is taken over tau. So if, if I have the integral taken over tau, uh, this plot actually, believe it or not, is going to have an axis where the axis is tau. So I think this might be the first plot that we've drawn in the class, which doesn't have a time axis. Okay, Maybe the second plot. So the axis here is tau. And so what I have is I have a step function, u of tau, that looks something like this. So here's my step function. And this is 1. Okay, And I'm essentially integrating this over some area from minus infinity to t, right? So I'm integrating this all the way up to some constant t. So the area of this integral is going to equal t times 1, which equals t, which is exactly what I would expect. OK, so in this particular case, I have written the ramp function in terms of the unit step function. Okay, So this is an equivalent representation. Uh, one more way to check your understanding, uh, just to you know, look at this and convince yourself, uh, some of you might be concerned that uh, this, uh, the piecewise form here does not exactly match t times u of t. And in fact, it does. And one way maybe that you can see that is if you want to further decompose this, you can actually go and decompose u of t, which is equal, remember from the previous slide, to 1, 0, if t is non-negative, 0, if t is negative. So clearly, if I multiply u of t by t, then I end up effectively with this round function representation, right? if I multiply by t. OK, very good. Now let's discuss another building block function. This is known as the unit triangle function. Write this as triangle of t. And this is equal to 1 minus the absolute value of t to 1 and 0 otherwise. So how might this uh, look if we were to draw it? So if we were to draw this, this might look something like this. Here we have, in this case, I'm going to draw the triangle of T. Excuse me, let me just erase this real quick. Triangle of T. So the triangle of T is going to have the time axis here and the amplitude here. So here is an amplitude of 1. And the triangle is actually going to be a triangle from minus 1 to 1 
and it'll look simply like that. Now, uh, you could actually go through an example here real quick. What would happen if I wanted to compute two, I'm going to use different colors. So two times twice the triangle plus triangle of t minus one. What would this look like? Well, let's draw it on a plot. And if we draw this on a plot, here's time. Here, let's draw each individual triangle one by one. So first I'm gonna draw this triangle in blue, right? It's two times regular triangle. So if it's two times regular triangle, this is nothing but a triangle that goes from minus one to plus one, okay? and peaks at two. So I'm gonna take this triangle and I'm gonna add it to another triangle. What's the other triangle I'm gonna add it to? Well, I'm gonna add it to another triangle that is the same as the regular triangle, but it has been shifted to the right by one unit. So it's gonna peak at one. So it's gonna be something like this. That's gonna reach two here. So if I were to just draw what my other triangle looks like, if I, the summation, so let's say the summation here is in red, the summation would look like something like this, and it's going to follow this contour right here. Okay. So that's what the summation would look like. Okay, now we'll come to perhaps the most important function, uh, and actually my favorite. And this is the impulse function known as the Dirac Delta. Okay. This is a very important for EE 102. So basically the Dirac delta function takes the form of delta of t. That's how we write this function. And there's, you know, some of you may have seen this delta function before. There's two types. There's the Dirac delta function named after Paul Dirac. And there's um, the Kronecker delta function, which we will not discuss in this lecture, which also uses the same symbol. Uh, you'll see when you go into more advanced types of mathematics, uh, using signal processing that these functions are very often interchangeable. But when teaching for the first time, we typically start with the Dirac delta function. And so for today's lecture and the next homework, just assume that uh, this delta of t is referring to the Dirac delta function. So what is the Dirac delta function? The Dirac delta function is very unique because it cannot be written in piecewise form. I cannot go and write it like this, right? You cannot go and write it like, you know, infinity, if uh, you know if uh, t is not equal to zero, zero otherwise, I can't really write it in this way formally, right? So this is incorrect. Incorrect. Uh, it's a faux pas to write it right like this, and that's exactly what makes this function very unique. So. Um, Maybe before we discuss the function itself, uh, just know that we cannot write this function. So before we write this function, we write this function, let us actually first understand its properties. So let us first understand its properties. Okay, so we'll call them features of the Dirac delta function. The first one is it's super tall. It's basically like a spike function, right? A Dirac delta function is kind of like a spike function. 
okay, it peaks at t equals zero. So the first property is that it's very large. Okay, at t equals zero, it approaches infinity. The second property is it's highly localized. So it's zero everywhere t is not equal to zero. So basically it's zero everywhere except t equals zero. The third property is that the area of this function is one. And so these three quantities effectively define a Dirac delta function. So now I'm gonna draw it in a little bit of a more uh, you know, precise way on the slide. So I'm gonna have my first axis here, which is gonna be as usual, the time axis t, okay? And here is zero. And so I'm gonna have zero here, and then I'm gonna have a spike here. That's what the Dirac delta function is. So this is gonna be delta of t. Now this spike is super tall, right? It, the spike kind of approaches infinity but we don't typically characterize the Dirac delta function by the height of the spike itself. Uh, we, calculate the, we characterize the numerical value of a Dirac delta function by the area of this uh, spike. So the area of the spike would be, for example, the integral of the spike. So if I integrate from minus one to zero on the positive side, okay, that integral of delta Dirac of t dt is gonna equal one, okay? That's how I characterize the area of Dirac. Conversely, if I were to do that same integral, but I were to integrate from to zero on the minus side, this would equal zero. Another way to think about it is the integral of the curve, the integral from minus one to plus one of delta of t dt equals one. And the integral in anywhere outside, the integral from maybe one to two of delta of t dt equals what? It equals zero. Okay. So this is one way that we analyze the Dirac impulse function, right? This is the Dirac. Now, we can go one layer deeper into the intuition behind the Dirac delta function. So if I look at the intuition, it's as follows. Imagine I had a rect function. So let's have a rect, remember that, remember that the rect was the following, rect of delta of t is nothing but a piecewise function with one over delta here from minus delta over two less than or equal to t less than or equal to delta over two. Okay. And then it was zero elsewhere. Just draw this a little better as a curvy bracket. Okay. So this was our rect function. So the first thing we can do is we could draw a rect of one. If I draw a rect of one, I end up with the following. This is minus one half. This is one half. And let's say this is one. I'm gonna end up with a function that looks something like this. Okay, so this is my rect of one. Now we can draw a rect of point one. So if I were to draw this, I'm gonna have my same axes. All right, I'm gonna have time here. Now, if I look at the uh, expression here in the top right, if I look at this expression, 
then what it's telling me is that this function is gonna have support or non-zeros at uh, minus delta over two, right? Delta is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 divided by two is 0 0.05. So right here I have minus 0 0.05 and here I have plus 0 0.05. And so what this gives me is it gives me another function, rec function, that looks something like this. Okay. So it gives me a skinny and tall rec function. Now these functions have the same area. So um, these have the same area. So in order to have the same area, the height of this needs to be quite high. So the height here, Right, if I were to extend out the y-axis, the hike here is going to be of value 10. Okay. What, uh, if I look at these uh, two separate curves, what that's really telling me is that effectively the Dirac function delta of t is kind of like the rec function taking the limit. It's like the limit as delta goes to zero of rect delta of t. That's what this intuition is telling me. As I reduce delta, the function becomes narrower and taller, right? It becomes skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and taller. And so if I were to look at what the ultimate Dirac delta function looks like, I have this same curves and this is t, and then the Dirac delta function is going to be the spike that is actually super tall, right? Super tall. So that is like taking this limit. And that's the intuition behind how the impulse function relates to the rec function. Okay. So we can continue in a number of ways. We can also do functional combinations. So I could take x of t and I could combine it with the rec function. You know, rec of t plus a Dirac delta function. And what this would look like is it would be like a curve. Here I have my time axis, right? Here's my axis. And so effectively, I'm going to have the rec function is going to start at negative one half. It's going to continue to one half, and it's going to basically hit one. This is the rec. But right here, as it's about to hit one, I have a spike here, and like this. So the basic idea is that I can chain the Dirac delta function with other functional forms if I wanted to. OK. Now, where the Dirac delta function becomes super interesting is in the context of something called sampling. So let's look at what sampling is. Let's say I have a function f of t. So f of t is just a generic function for now. It's just some function. This is time. And so I have this function f of t, and it might look something like this, you know, some nice smooth function like this. This is my friend f of t. Now, if I take f of t, I can actually take f of t and multiply it by Dirac of t. And what does that give us? So as a check your understanding question, uh, you can draw it on paper or you can think in your head, what would f of t times the Dirac of t look like on a plot? Okay. So why don't you go ahead, pause the video, and see if you can answer that question. Okay, welcome back. So effectively, what's happening is this. Uh, you're taking f of t and then you're multiplying it by this super narrow thing, right? Uh, you're multiplying it by this super narrow thing right here. Which goes all the way up. So I'm multiplying it by this thing. Now, if I look at that, f of t times delta of t, what this is equal to 
is f of zero times delta of t. It is always true that for any f of t, f of t times delta of t is going to equal f of zero times delta of t. Why is that? Well, because delta of t is zero everywhere else, uh, it doesn't matter you know, uh, what f of t equals elsewhere. I only need to consider f of t where it overlaps with delta of t, which is equal to zero. So if I look at it this way, um, and can express things this way. I could take some complicated signal f of t, but if I know it's being multiplied by the Dirac delta function, then I only need to evaluate or sample that signal at f of zero. If we were to also borrow our rect intuition, uh, one other way of looking at this is f of t. If I did not want to use Dirac's, I could use f of t multiplied by some rect, a really, really small uh, delta. So 0 0.0001, right, for example, of t. This would have the exact same property. Right? This is approximately equal to f of 0 times the rect of 0 0.001 of t. Okay. Now, where this becomes even more interesting is in the context of mathematics. So many times we might deal with, as we will actually see in this class, we might deal with an integral of the form of f of t times delta of t dt ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. Now, for any arbitrary f of t, it might be hard to get uh, reasoning about this, right? Because this can apply to any type of f of t. But actually, what I can do is I could use my principle from before to simplify this to the following. f of 0 delta of t dt. So effectively, because I know that uh, the only point that, that uh, if I look at this integral, it should kind of just make sense that if t is equal to any value other than 0, delta of t is equal to 0, right? So it doesn't make sense to go and evaluate. That doesn't contribute to the integral, because the integral is the product of both. So for the integral to be the product, this integral is a product of these two functions, right? So both of these functions both have to be non-zero non-zero to contribute to the integral, to contribute to the integral. If any one of them is known to be zero, we don't need to evaluate the integral at that point. So in this particular case, we know that delta of t is only non-zero at t equals zero. Therefore, I only need to evaluate f of t at t equals zero. And that's, again, what gives me this equality here. Now, if I have this, where, where this is very helpful is because f of zero is not time dependent, it's actually just a constant, I can pop it out of the integral, right? I can put it here, and I only need to take the integral of delta of t dt. But remember that the delta function, Dirac delta function, just by definition, the Dirac delta, the area is one. Therefore, this is nothing but f of 0. So as long as f of 0 is continuous, as long as at t equals 0, I can apply this sampling trick. OK. So. This brings us to a related property about the impulse function, known as the impulse sifting property. So what does this look like? Well, remember that if I have, in the previous slide, we assumed that the delta, direct delta, was centered around t equals 0. 
because it was centered around t equals zero, what I'm doing is I'm effectively sampling the value at f of zero. So you see, um, if I have, uh, the, the whole point of this exercise was not just mathematical manipulation. The point here is to show that if I look at this first expression here, I'll just underline it here, this first expression here is equal to this underlying expression. So I have a complicated function f of t. As soon as I hammer it with a Dirac, meaning I multiply it with a Dirac, as soon as I do that, then it just simplifies to a very benign f of zero, which is where the Dirac was centered. So the Dirac is giving me some indication about sampling. So I don't need to only sample at f of zero, right? I could get any arbitrary f that I wanted to. So how would I do that? Well, one way I would do that is to use what's called the sifting property, which is the exact same as the previous slide, but slightly generalized. Slightly generalized so that the Dirac may not be centered only at t equals zero. So this would look like the following. So I have an integral, and that integral is gonna be f of t multiplied by the Dirac of t minus tau, right? I have a Dirac centered somewhere on some dummy variable tau. Okay, that's where the Dirac is centered. And if I do this, you should be able to calculate what uh, the output is. So as a check your understanding question, CYU, you can go ahead and calculate this. So feel free to pause the video and try to calculate uh, what the expression for this would be. Uh, as a hint, try to use the last slide. Okay, welcome back. So some of you would have calculated this and you would have gotten actually f evaluated at tau. Okay, effectively this is evaluated where the Dirac is equal to uh, is, is non-zero, right? So f is evaluated at the point where the Dirac is non-zero and Dirac is non-zero at tau. So one way to look at this is a plot. So I might draw a plot here. This axis would be time. And the Dirac lives somewhere here. The Dirac lives at tau. Just draw that in blue here. The Dirac lives at tau, somewhere over here. Remember the height of the Dirac is not representative of anything. You can assume that the height kind of approaches infinity. And this is equal to delta of t minus tau. And if I had a delta of tau, this is this would be delta of simple t, right? Delta of t is related by this kind of shift. Now what I can do is I can draw the function f, right? So the function f might look something like this friendly function. It does not need to approach uh, the direct, so let me just draw it again. This is my f, f of t. And so if I look at this f of t and I, I multiply it by tau, I'm effectively just evaluating f at this point. That's effectively what that's doing. It's evaluating f of t at t equals tau. So concretely, if I were to write this as an expression, f of t times the Dirac of t minus tau is also equal to f of tau times the Dirac of t minus tau. Okay. Now, what happens if we generalize this a little bit? Instead of multiplying by a shifted uh, delta function, Dirac delta function, we may want to multiply by a scaled Dirac delta function. So a scaled Dirac delta function might look something like this, right? It might be some constant C times the Dirac delta of T. And what this is going to give you is it's going to give you another function. And if I'm going to integrate that, let's assume I'm integrating my function, the integral of F of T, multiplied by, and I'll just change color here, C of delta of t, dt, this function is going to equal 
times f of zero. And that'll look something like this. Here I have time. And here I have some scaling of C of delta of two. Okay. So to kind of summarize, the key points here are that the direct delta function, you can integrate it and um, it has this sifting property where effectively, if the direct delta is ever within the integral with another function, you only need to care about the other function where the delta function is not zero. So here are some quick examples that we talked about of integrals of the delta function. The integral of a delta function from minus infinity to infinity is going to equal 1. The integral of the delta function from minus infinity to 0, but 0 on the negative side, is going to equal 0. And finally, the integral of the delta function from minus infinity to 0 on the positive side is going to be equal to 1. OK. So here's an example question as a check your understanding. Let's see if you can calculate this integral. Now, let me first draw this function f of t. f of t looks something like this. Let's use black. So here we have time, and here's my y-axis, and let's, this is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so let's say that f of t is some sort of staircase function. So it's 0 here, and then kind of like it's about 1 over here, about 1, a height of 1. So this is 1. And then it goes up again to 2. Okay, So this is a staircase. And then it goes immediately back down to zero for half a unit. This will be 0 0.5, goes back up to one, and continues all the way up until 2.5. And then it goes back up to two. All right, so please go ahead and compute this integral here. Once you are done with that, you, you know, feel free to pause the video and see if you can calculate that. OK, very good. Uh, welcome back. Now, if we look at this integral, let's rewrite it on the bottom here. Okay. This integral is nothing but the following. It's going to equal integral from minus 2 to 3 on the positive side of f of t dt plus going to equal f of minus 1 plus f of 1 plus should equal 3f of 1 plus 
two times f of minus three. Minus three. But since minus three was not in the integral limits, right? Since it was not in the integral limits, this effectively is going to be zero. Okay. So what we've done is we've used this Dirac here in green. We've used this Dirac in purple. And we've used finally this Dirac in yellow. And finally, this one in blue. So you can see how the Dirac's instantly tell us what the integral is, right? We know that the yellow Dirac, uh, I only need to evaluate f of t when the argument of the Dirac delta function is 0, which would happen at t equals minus 1. So that, therefore, I have here on the bottom, I have f of minus 1, right? That's why I have that. The purple, same thing. I only need to evaluate the f of 1, and I scale it by 3. The green one is the same thing, but it effectively, it, I, I only need to evaluate f of t at minus 3, but minus 3 is outside of the integral. So I don't need to actually calculate that out. So now let's look at what the number would be. right? Uh, this would actually equal, I can actually calculate analytically what this would be. Let's use black ink. Right? This integral from minus 2 to 3 on the plus side of f, let's first calculate this term. This term is equal to, let's see, so at uh, minus 2, this is, um, what is the area here? The area here is to minus 2 to 3. So this would be, this would be about 4 here. This is 0 plus uh, 2 times um, 1, so that's uh, 6, plus uh, 0.5 times 2, so that's equal to 7. Okay. So this integral here is equal to 7. This guy here, f of minus 1, right? f of minus 1 is actually 2. Uh, 3 times f of 1 f of 1 is 1. 3 times that is 3. Okay. Let's use blacking so it shows up. f of minus 1 is 2. This portion is going to be minus 3. Okay. So I end up with um, 7. plus 2 minus 3. So 7 plus 2 minus 3 is 9 minus 3, and that equals 6. So the answer to this question should have been 6. OK. As a further check your understanding, please compute the uh, impulse, the integral of this uh, Dirac impulse function. So remember, we computed the integral uh, of the impulse function, right? We know that the area under the impulse function uh, from minus infinity to infinity is going to equal 1 in general, right? Uh, but we can also compute the integral, which is the summation of many, many different impulse functions, all right, uh, from minus infinity to t. And so uh, a common theme that you'll see in the next homework is writing one function uh, using elementary building blocks of another function. So in this particular case, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to write down the integral here, the integral of this function. And I want you to write it down uh, using um, the building blocks that we have learned in the class. Okay. So give that a try. And then uh, uh, we will resync after you pause the video. OK, so let's think about this. The integral of a Dirac delta function is going to equal 
1 for t greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. And this function is also equal to u of t, which is the step function. Therefore, the integral of the step function, the integral of a Dirac function is the step function. And conversely, the derivative of the step function is going to be the delta function. Okay. So integral of Dirac is the step function and derivative of Dirac is the uh, derivative of the step function is the Dirac. So now you can calculate more advanced integrals, like asking yourself, what is the integral from minus infinity to some constant s, uh, double integral, let's make it a double integral from minus infinity to t, uh, the Dirac of tau d tau dt. So what is this integral? Well, if I look at it, I'm just asking what is the double integral of a Dirac delta function with these limits? So we know that the single integral, right, the first integral, if I take that, that's going to give me the step function. Right? This is minus infinity to s and u of t dt. And we know that if we take this integral of the step function, we get the ramp function, right? The integral of the Heaviside step function is the ramp function. So therefore, we have this chain reaction here where we have the Dirac function, we have the step function, and we have the ramp function. And these are all related in the sense that the um, Dirac function, if you integrate it, it gives you the step. If you integrate that, it gives you the ramp. And conversely, if you differentiate the ramp, you get the step. If you differentiate the step, you get the Dirac. Okay. So here's one more example. So suppose that you have some x of t, and that's going to equal this function here, 1 plus uh, a Dirac that's uh, centered around t equals 1 minus twice a Dirac that's centered around t equals 2. Okay. So let's kind of draw visually what this integral is. So to draw the integral, let's first draw x of t before drawing y of t. So on the first plot here, I'm going to draw x of t. So x of t here, here are my axes of time. You're going to end up with everything is 1, except you're going to have a Dirac at t equals 1. So let's use this one to be our Dirac. So here's 1, here's a Dirac, and here's 2. And I'm going to have another Dirac here, right, going the other way. And so the question is, and let's just say that this is twice the scale. And the question is, what is the integral of this function, right? If I look at this, the integral is being taken from limits of 0 to t, just so you note. Therefore, uh, if I want to calculate this integral, I can plot it as follows. Here I have time t. And the integral, ordinarily, let's ignore the Dirac for a moment. Ordinarily, if I were to take the integral, I would end up with a ramp function, right? I would just end up with a ramp function. However, this only holds up until the first Dirac. So here we have 1. And so it's a nice, clean ramp function up until the, I hit the first Dirac. Once I hit this first blue Dirac, what that's going to do is going to immediately add the area of the Dirac to my curve. The area of the Dirac, remember, is always going to be 1. So here I have 2. And because of the Dirac, the blue Dirac, the integral of the curve all the way jumps up to 2 here. Okay. Now I continue as before with a clean ramp function. 
all the way up to three. But now I've hit the second Dirac, which actually has an area of two, right? Because scaled by, by two. So it drops me down from three all the way back to one. And now I have no more Dirac's in my path. So I am free to just continue growing like this. And so this is what the integral of this function would look like with Dirac's. This is another way to visually see what you're getting. The final topic that we'll discuss today in brief detail is systems. A system is something that, remember, a, a signal is a function, and a system is something that does something to a signal. So a system transforms an input signal into an output signal. That's what it does. Okay. So if I draw this uh, diagram for how a system should look like, I start with an arrow here that is some x that goes as input to my system. Here I have a system, let's call that s. And it's going to output something y. Okay, so this is a system. Systems are similar to functions in the sense that uh, they do something to an object, right? A function does something to a real number to give you another real number. It's like a mathematical machine. A system is similar, but but the input and output of a system is other signals, right? So strictly speaking, in mathematics, they might call a system as an operator rather than just a function, right? Uh, for the purpose of EE102, we will not nitpick the distinction between functions and systems. If you want to call a system a function for, uh, if it helps you understand the concept better, that's totally fine. Um, it's kind of helpful to think of it that way because functions have parameters and systems also have parameters. For example, this particular system has a single in input, which is X, and a single output, which is Y. So therefore, it's a single output, single input, single output system. So it's a SISO system. So in EE102, we will focus on such systems that take as input one uh, signal and output another signal. But just in general, please note that systems can be more complicated than other classes. You can take a group of signals in and output only one, or you could take as input one signal and then output 10 different signals. Okay. In the next lecture, we will continue our discussion of systems. Uh, thanks for your attention.